was no possible reconciliation in sight. I leaned on a few people to get me through this adjustment. My sponsor suggested working the 12 steps, and when your knees knock, kneel. Needless to say, I spent a lot of time on my knees. I also relied on NA literature, because there were no NA meetings around me. I asked God as we understand him to come into my life and take some of the pain. He did. My life became a lot better and easier to bear after that. 90 Narcotics Anonymous Then God used me with the aid of other people in starting our first NA meeting in our area. At that time in our tri-state area, there was not one NA meeting in West Virginia, Ohio, or Western Pennsylvania. I did the best I could, as we all did. We now have approximately 75 meetings in a 100-mile radius. We have a hotline, an area service committee, and a regional service committee. I attended the World Service Conference two years ago. When I came back, I did some public information work in radio, television, and newspaper. A while later, I started to date the disc jockey from the radio station where we broadcasted public information. We had a lot of fun together. We went to the first East Coast convention, where she was the disc jockey. We started to make plans for our marriage. As most normal relationships go, we had a fight on the phone one night. But a real shock came the next day when her mother called to tell me that she had been killed in a car accident at night. I felt like killing myself. I knew there was pain coming. Pain I didn't want to feel. I didn't want to turn to drugs either, because I knew that was not the answer. I called my friend and just started crying. He came over to my house and gave me a big hug and said, just tell me you didn't get high. Somehow I knew everything would be alright, and I guess out of relief, I started to laugh. I continued to rely on NA even more. I went to more meetings, talked about it and before I knew it, the pain was easing and I was handling it without using drugs. I asked God to come into my heart, and I thanked Him for putting her briefly into my life. Now I know that everything I have is only borrowed from God. I met someone very special after that and got married. She is also in NA. I am working on my seventh clean year. My life is a lot better today than it has ever been. I am happy, and I feel good about myself. I still go to five meetings a week. It helps to be in contact with people who have the same problem that I have. All of my friends are through N.A. N.A. saved my life. N.A. is my life. If I can do it, so can you 91. I if I can do it, so can you. My first introduction to drugs was at the age of 15. A friend gave me some speed, and I fell in love. As I approached high school, I had the distinct impression that I could jump right over the building. I never forgot that surge of power that I associated with speed. I sought to recapture that same feeling for many years. I think that I was predisposed to addiction. Deep inside, I had feelings of inadequacy and inferiority. In my twisted thinking, it seemed logical that if I could stay up 24 hours a day, I could catch up with everyone and be as good as them. It took a lot of pain and many years of abuse before I realized that no matter how much speed I took, I could never feel that I was okay.
The next eight years of my life were a nightmare of compulsive achievements coupled with large quantities of speed and other drugs. I graduated from high school at the age of 16, on the Dean's List. That was followed by two different bachelor's degrees, both with honors. Yet, I still felt that it wasn't enough. I was caught in a deadly cycle. I knew that I couldn't go on to graduate school without speed, and I knew that speed was killing me. In the process of my using, I tried many other drugs. Foolishly, I would boast of all the different drugs I had used. But I made a distinction between party drugs, such as hallucinogenics, alcohol, cocaine and marijuana, and serious drugs such as heroin and speed. I used speed, because I thought I had a real need for it. I didn't know how to function without it. I figured there was something wrong with me, that I wasn't as efficient as other people. I had to constantly prove myself. I flaunted my degrees and my achievements in order to win acceptance. Today, I know that those gnawing feelings of inferiority are a part of my addiction. Drugs were my god and I prostrated myself before them. I lied to myself and to others, used evil, conned them and stole from them. Deep down, I loathed myself for these actions, but I didn't know how to identify or to express my feelings. My habit had progressed to the level where I, 91, 92 Narcotics Anonymous, would stay up for a week at a time. During these runs, I would become so irrational that I could not even carry on a conversation. I hallucinated visually and orally, became extremely forgetful and needless to say irritable and grouchy. Then I would level off, and no matter how much speed I took, I couldn't get any higher. My body would ache for sleep, but my mind would rage. I was caught at a halfway point where I could neither stay up nor sleep. It was at these times when inordinate paranoia and depression would set in. Sometimes I would try taking barbiturates to put me to sleep, but each time I became ill and vomited them up. Many people, including my family, tried to convince me to give up drugs. But I was impatient with them, insisting that they just didn't understand. I justified my using, saying that I never used drugs, just for a good time, but only when I needed them, which became all of the time. I developed a passion for drugs. I would steal pills from people's medicine cabinets and look them up in a physician's best reference to see why they were used. Inevitably, I would develop the exact symptoms alleviated by a particular pill. There was no length to which I would not go to rationalize my moving. As with anyone who abuses mind-altering chemicals, my life was chaotic and unmanageable. I was well aware of it, but I never dreamed it had anything to do with my addiction. I blamed other people, neighborhoods, jobs and cities for the problems I was having. I tried the geographic sphere six times, driving across the country, alone each time. Running scared, I always ran to the same place, Minneapolis, where I was raised, and San Diego where I went to school. I quit jobs at random and moved frequently. I got arrested, overdosed, and finally suicidal depression set in. But I still wouldn't give up my drugs. What finally made an impression on me was a series of events that happened in rapid succession. My world started falling apart when my brother killed himself. Three months later, I experienced a sudden and severe hearing loss. 
The Pewdie Brock says my boyfriend is three years breaking up with me. Devastated, I felt totally alone and abandoned. I couldn't communicate with anyone, and again, I felt that no one understood. Instinctively, I realized that the speed was the cause of my hearing loss. Terrified of losing my remaining hearing, I resolved never to lose speed again. Not understanding my addictive personality, I thought if I abstained from speed, everything would be fine. But everything only got worse, because I then began abusing alcohol, marijuana and food. Because I did not have a program. If I can do it, so can you 93. For knowledge of my condition, only fear and resolution, the time came when I used again. This time, things were looking up for me. I had purchased hearing aids and gone through therapy. I really felt like I had conquered my problem. I had no mental defense whatsoever. When it was offered, I indulged, without thinking twice about it. After I was high, I remembered that I had quit using drugs. Once again, I resolved never to use narcotics again. This time, I allowed myself organic drugs, like psilocybin, marijuana and methgallin. Surely they wouldn't harm me like the speed had. Ignoring my drug problem completely, I became concerned with my increasing weight. I got involved in another 12-step program but experienced no success. For a year, I continued insanely abusing drugs, alcohol and food, but I kept going back to meetings. The members kept questioning me about my drug usage and suggested I try NA. Finally, I agreed to go, only so they would stop bothering me about it. I went to the NA meeting stoned and didn't remember anything I heard. I am not sure why I kept going back. Perhaps the love and acceptance in those rooms was what drew me. I continued this way for five months, calling myself clean because I was not using speed. But after a few months, I started sharing with other addicts that I was still using marijuana. To my surprise, they did not make any kind of judgment, but merely shared their own experience. They had discovered that they couldn't recover unless they abstained from all drugs. But I was overly sensitive and distrustful. I argued adamantly that marijuana wasn't a drug, that it was no worse than cigarettes. They only smiled and asked me to keep coming back. It took five months of going to meetings, meeting, and watching them, for me to finally get some hope. Before I didn't believe that it was possible to give up drugs entirely, so I maintained that I didn't want to stop just in case I failed. But after five months, I began to believe that recovery really was possible. I saw the same people week after week, and they stayed clean. I knew from the way they talked that they were true addicts just like me, and I began to feel that I belonged. Best of all, I began to feel hopeful. I saw a way out of the vicious drug circle. The miraculous day of my last hike came shortly after New Year's Day. It was cold and raining in San Diego, and I was fed up with everyone. The holidays had been a letdown. I didn't get the gift or attention that I wanted, and a man that I had been dating rejected me. I proceeded to use all of my favorites, marijuana, alcohol and food, straight into oblivion. Hours later, it stopped raining. I woke up and went out into the backyard. 94 Narcotics Anonymous. I wasn't wearing my hearing aid. 
As I stood looking down on a beautiful canyon, I began to pray. I didn't know the room or to what I was talking, but I was asking. I wanted what those people in NA had, quote. I felt desperate, alone and helpless. When I finished my prayer, I stood quietly alone for a few minutes. Very soon, I heard the sweet chimes of the phone ringing. It has never sounded so good as it did that day I heard the phone ring 50 feet or more away without my hearing aid. I burst into joyful tears at just being able to hear it, and I ran all the way to answer it. The person on the other end was an NA member that I knew well. He asked me if I was going to a meeting that night. I hadn't even considered a meeting that night, and I told him how I got him high again that day. His reaction was totally unexpected, he was concerned. It had never mattered to anyone before whether I got high or not. And, I must point out, that I was not romantically involved with this man. He merely expressed the concern of the N.A. Fellowship. When I went to the meeting that night, and shared what had happened, many people gave me their phone numbers. They made me promise to call before I used again. Miracle that it is, I haven't used since. Like the addicts who had shared with me, I found that growth began once I abstained from all drugs. I was successful in the other 12-step program, once I got clean. Those addicts encouraged me and assured me through all the ups and downs of my early recovery. They entreated me to get a sponsor, and I did. This woman patiently led me through the steps. My higher power, at first, was the N.A. Fellowship. It represented goodness and caring, and I trusted those recovering addicts. But eventually, the time came when I was alone, in the middle of the day with no meeting, and I wanted to use. I saw that I needed a higher power that would be with me 24 hours a day, just as my addiction is with me 24 hours a day. I began to pray, reveal yourself to me. I didn't know who I was talking to, but I did it for two weeks. What happened was that I began to see evidence of God in the people around me and even in my own life. So many things happened that were too coincidental. There just had to be a God. It took some time for me to trust my new friend enough to work the third step. I had to get rid of all my old fears and ideas of the God that I knew as a child. Eventually, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him. I went on with the steps and I began to change. Myself speaking, dishonesty and other character defects were revealed. If I can do it, so can you 95 to me, and they caused me pain. I no longer want to live the way I used to. I asked my God to remove my defects of character. But instead of magically disappearing, as I expected, he has been showing me where and when I'm doing them, and how to change. I saw that in order to get over my fear of people, I had to go to those I fear the most and make amends for my past behavior. When I stop being dishonest, I can stop hiding and I'm no longer afraid of being found out. I can look people in the eye with some self-respect, because I've done my best to set matters right. I don't live the old way today. All of my character defects haven't been removed. I'm not always serene and happy. I'm not scared or perfect yet. Every day I see areas where I need to grow. But I know today, that as I continue in the fellowship of N.A., working the steps, 
listening to my sponsor and my higher power, I will continue to grow emotionally and spiritually. I pray on a daily basis, asking my higher power to help me stay clean one more day. I ask him to run my life, and to give me the power to carry out his will. I like the person that I'm becoming as a result of working the steps. I've learned that as an addict, my natural disposition is to be high. In order for me to abstain from drugs, I've got to change. The 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous are the only things that have ever changed me for the better. I can't possibly express in words the gratitude I feel for my recovery in NA. For the first time, my life is precious to me. The fellowship is very dear to me also, and I share the gift of recovery through service. I have had several jobs in the service structure of NA, and I find them rewarding as well as helpful. Service helps me stay clean. There have been many times when I have wanted to mope over my own problems, and I have received a phone call from another member needing something. Inevitably, in trying to help them, I forgot about myself and my horrible problems and stayed clean another day. My story is not unique. Hundreds of addicts have told their stories and I see how we are similar in some ways. If I can recover in the NA fellowship, so can you. If you are an addict, why not give yourself a chance and try NA? It costs nothing to join, and at least for me, I didn't have much left to lose. 96 Narcotics Anonymous A N Indian without a tribe Loneliness is something that I've lived with for years. From the time I was a child, people always let me know that I was different. This was fun for a while. In later years, my feeling of being different was one of the things that brought me to the program of Narcotics Anonymous. I grew up in a Texas town. I was one of those kids from the other side of the track. I was the middle child with a brother eight years older. I always wanted to be like him, so I would tag along with him and his friends. They used to get me loaded. I always got high to a point of not remembering what had happened the night before. This phase lasted about four years. My brother got busted, and the phase ended. I came down with hepatitis, and ended up in the hospital. This was the first of many institutions for me. The doctor told me to quit using drugs. He was the first to tell me that I had a drug problem. I knew he was right. I thought that everyone had a place in life, and mine was to be a drug addict. I accepted this place completely. I didn't think anyone could change it. After my bout with hepatitis, I returned to drugs. I became addicted to heroin. I was 14 years old. Heroin was the answer to all my problems. It made me feel like I could finally fit in. No longer did I feel different. All are equal in addiction. I was kicked out of my house, and I swore never to return. For the next three years, I ran the streets, traveling all over the country, looking for that place where things would be different. I got busted for possession, so I joined the army to be the case. This was going to solve my problem. I was shipped to Vietnam, where I really got further down in my addiction. Not long after I arrived in Vietnam, I was arrested again. This time, they sent me to a hospital in Germany for drug abusers. I really liked it there. There were plenty of drugs available, and they were really cheap. Mistakenly, 
I thought the hospital had cured me. Soon after I got out of the hospital, I was discharged from the military for failure to rehabilitate. I was sent home with a drug habit. 96. An Indian without a tribe. 97. The drugs on the streets weren't strong enough for me, so I ended up on a methadone program. This was cleaning up, I thought. Not long after I got home, I was arrested again. This time I went to prison. That was in the latter part of 1974. I became institutionalized very quickly. I was released from prison in 1977, right before Thanksgiving. I remember how frightened I was of all people. A part of me wanted to be back in prison. I got high to cover up those feelings. Before I knew it, there I was again, addicted. I had a job and was working steadily, but my life wasn't working, I was still drug dependent. This was the beginning of the end, the start of my recovery. I was in a state of hopeless desperation, I just wanted to lay down and die. I looked for a methadone program, but none were available. My boss asked me the next day what was wrong with me. Before I knew it, I was telling him the truth. I said I was a drug addict. He asked me if I wanted help. I told him, yes. This was the first of many spiritual awakenings. I went to a hospital in Louisiana and from there to a halfway house. This is where I found Narcotics Anonymous. N.A. was a tribe I never had. I found the same type of people that I had run with on the street. There was something different about them. They had a piece I wanted. The first six months of my recovery were hard. I couldn't talk without making everything rhyme. I had no control over this, so I stayed frustrated. My head would jerk at the oddest time. My arms would fly up without my permission. Through all these problems, the people of the fellowship kept telling me to come back. I did. I was told to get a sponsor, attend a lot of meetings, get phone numbers and get involved. I tried to do all these things. I was introduced to the steps and traditions. I got involved early in my clean time. I picked up ash trays, made coffee, and did everything I was asked to do. I gained some self-respect from these actions. Before, I had thought I was worthless. The people in the meetings loved me and guided me back to reality. Through working the steps and gaining a working knowledge of the tradition, recovery became exciting. My old patterns of behavior started to leave me. I didn't react to things in the same ways I had in the past. I first got involved in service work during my second month in N.A. This involvement has formed the backbone of my program. It gave me a feeling that I had something to give. 98 Narcotics Anonymous I have had the good fortune to be involved with a lot of people all over the country who are doing the same thing I am, staying clean. I found that this program works like my addiction did, it gives me all I need to keep from getting sick. When I was using, sometimes I would get a little extra. Now, the same is true in the program. I get that little extra with every spiritual experience, and my service work brings me one spiritual experience after another. This is what keeps me coming back. I go to meetings daily, and talk to someone who is doing the same thing that I am, caring and sharing me in a way. This is what allows me to take a back seat and let my higher power take over the wheel. 
I'll always be grateful to N.A. for taking me from the depths of my addiction and giving me life. A life that is full of love and true concern for others. These are feelings that I never thought could be possible for me.